What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to Double M Live. Did you miss us? Did you live. miss us? It's been two weeks, but it felt like it's been a long time, brother. Episode, episode 81. And you know what we like to do here on this show when we get to some special numbers. 81. That holds a, that was a special place in my heart, Marv. Sure does. The GOAT? We talking okay. GOAT wide receivers? GOAT wide receiver, 81. Ooh, Moss. Am I putting Moss? I'm taking Moss as the greatest wide receiver of all time. I got to. I got to. Ooh. He's definitely the greatest wide receiver to wear number 81. Oh yeah, that's that's there's no debate there. There's if no debate. Had, there. If he had one, I don't I know I don't want to bring it up. I know I don't know everyone wants to hear it. But he if he had one with us in 2007, that debate of who's the greatest wide receiver of all time between him and Rice would have been real good. The but Patriots, he doesn't have the hardware. He doesn't have the hardware. The Patriots not getting that Super Bowl will literally burn my soul for the rest of my life. For the rest <laughs> of my life. I'm telling you. That season still burns me. I shed tears that night. I shed tears that Bra night. Brady, Brady just came out. I think he said he'd give up two rings. He sure to, did. To get that perfect season. <sighs> hey, that's how much that season meant to be etched in history like that. Undefeated season. Oh, man. Oh, man. It, uh, please, no more. No more. We're, no more, we're, no more. we're already known as mass holes. Imagine, <laughs> imagine if we went undefeated, Mike Nice. Oh, I, brother. It would have been, <laughs> been bad. But. Since we're talking Patriots theme, welcome back, everyone, here to Double M Live. Mr. Mike Nice, Marv's in the building. But, Mike, we got a special show for them today. Special show indeed. So, you know, we're going to dive right into what's on the playlist because, like Marv said, we got a special show. And usually with a special show, we have a special guest. Yes, sir. And for episode 81, we have a great special guest as we continue with our football conversation, with our Patriots conversation. And this special guest right here is none other than the Patriots insider for NBC Sports Boston. He also hosts a, bu a bunch of other shows, you know, check out Quick Slants for sure. But from NBC Sports Boston, none other than Tom E. Curran is in the building. Tom E. Curran. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is this Eminem Live? <laughs> Double M Live. This is Eminem Live. We yes, here, sir. baby. We What's here. Up, fellas? Thank you so much for having me. And I like that debate about the all-time 81s. There really isn't another 81 I can come up with. It's not T. even really. T.O.'s there, but he's not there. T.O. is, yeah, you know what? I can't even believe I forgot T.O. You know, I got stuck on Russ Francis. That's way old. That's 81 tight end from the 70s with the Patriots. But I look at Jerry Rice, and I'm like thinking he's like Babe Ruth. I mean, he did it until he was 43 too. Yeah, 40 friggin' three with the Broncos. He was still catching passes. Nuts. Rice, Rice definitely has the longevity. Um, I think you know a little bias over here because getting to watch Randy Moss those few seasons, uh, with him as a Patriot just really. <sighs> there's never been anything after him that play that has. Anyone after him that's played wide receiver, the Patriots that's that's been anywhere close to his level during his time here. So it's the bias, I'm, I'm definitely I'm definitely with it for sure. <laughs> you talk about lucky in covering this team and growing up here and being from Pembroke and um, you know basically living here all my life. You know you're in 2007 and you're watching Tom Brady and Randy Moss work on the side. You're watching in 2014, Brady and Gronk and Darrell Revis work on the side, just work on their craft together in a training camp setting. And you're like, this is, and Bill Belichick's walking around over here. And, you know, it's just, you're just lucky, lucky to yeah. be right place, right time, right, to, right profession. I bet I bet a season like last year really makes you think back about the, through those years and be like, <laughs> whoa, we had it good. We had it well, good back then. It does. You know, because you knew the whole time it's going to end at some point, and it's going to yeah. end at some point, and it might end with a thud. But, you know, all the things they've done, Mike and Marv, this offseason, it at least has reignited the idea that, okay, it's never going to be like it was, but it doesn't have to be a parade of six and tens and seven and nines. I have to get used to the 17-game seasons and seven and tens. 
You know, it doesn't have to be right. like that the way it has been elsewhere. And I think they're really primed to, to have a, a significant bounce from last year. Yeah. So, I mean, I definitely want to jump into that conversation for sure, because the Patriots, the way they came out this offseason, the, well, the way Bill Belichick came out this offseason, I don't think or I can't remember seeing an, a team in any sport, any of the, the four major sports come out firing on all cylinders the way they just bang, bang, signing, 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 big name, signing, big name. I, I don't remember ever seeing that happen, you know, during all the years I've been paying attention to sports. But the Patriots came out just picking guys up. It seemed like every minute you look at the clock, you check your phone, you refresh Twitter or social media, Patriots have somebody new. So, you know, when that was all unfolding, and even even fast forward to this day, what is what was just your thought process seeing that happen and just seeing Bill Belichick tap into this type of aggressive mindset that we haven't really seen from him before? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, we could just we could spend the entire segment on this. Um, you know, first off, he explained during the season last September, look, we we're, we're getting right with the cap. Um, we had a lot of dead money around, and I think when we look at that too, Bill seem to kind of push his chips into the, hey, we're just a victim of circumstance here. But I think a lot of it, too, had to do with, look, you had an opportunity to do Brady earlier and do him at more manageable funds, and you kind of pissed it away. And you kind of had opportunities to address wide receiver yeah. in the draft. But you didn't do it, and now you carry a dead money from Antonio Brown. All these things kind of, and there was more. But basically, they kind of made their bed that they had to sleep in financially last year. And they didn't do anything in quarterback. But in the offseason, Bill made it clear he's not going to go 7-9 and nine and have guys like me second-guessing him on his draft all year and listen to that foolishness again. So what I thought was really interesting, guys, was the way they went about it. We know the Patriots as being very close to the vest, quiet, do things by the book. But when that tampering period started, they didn't wait to announce stuff, which is something they usually do. They wanted to change the conversation around their team as fast as they could, and they did so. And I, I don't begrudge them that because they had taken piles of crap from us, and they changed the conversation in a real hurry. And my reaction was, good. This is great. You didn't do what? Do I look like a giant floating head now that it's gotten dark in my car? <laughs> look, you, you, you still look good. As long as we can hear you, you you good. You good. Uh, I'm moving. I look. I look like a giant floating head. Um, but I think that that was one really interesting thing about it was they had taken on so much crap. They're like, no, we're not. We're, we're telling you exactly how we're going to operate in 2021. So I thought that that was really telling, fellas. All right. So let's let's get to the draft. Um, Got beat up a lot this this year when when it came to especially from you you said it yourself just hearing about how badly he's been drafting these past years. When you look at the draft this year, you know obviously we we, we got Mac Jones who we're gonna dive into in a bit. Christian Barrymore, Ronnie Perkins. Do you think or did you see the Patriots going a different way when they drafted this year? Did they strategize differently? Did Belichick do anything differently that you said okay he's actually listening to other people now? I do think they took fewer risks. I wonder if that was a byproduct of the fact they couldn't go and scout as actively mm. at some of the lower places. Like you're not going to see necessarily Kyle Duggar, Lenore Ryan, who is a standout compared right. to some of the, he's going to be a pro bowl player in my estimation. He's frigging good. But um, plus there was a smaller crop guys this year. A lot of, players didn't enter they had opportunities to go back to school if they didn't have a, a season so i thought they took kind of chalk as they say draft picks was it more of a collaboration you know i was told from from folks well placed in the organization that they sensed that as well it wasn't a, a collaboration that bill was told he had to do i think it was more i was explained to me organic in that okay casario and bill did it all on their own mm -hmm. now casario's gone and Bill has to open it up to some other guys just because he needs the assistance. Nick had so many hats on that he needed some other hats put on some other heads. So he did that. So it had to be a collaboration. 
I don't think Bill is the dick that people think he is <laughs> to his co-workers. I think he listens to people and trusts people. As long as you have your shit together, he doesn't care if you're 22, 32, 42, 52. If you come to the table with a good, solid, studious reason for doing something, he's going to listen to you. So yeah. it's it's different than I think people interpret it. So that's that's my two cents on, on the way they did it, Mark. Thank you. So, you know, the big money question is obviously, even going into the draft, you know, people assumed – the Patriots might find their next guy, their next franchise quarterback in this draft. You know, the questions floating around, who should they take? Will they move up to take somebody else? The questions, you know, floated around for a long period of time. Then you finally get to the draft. And at number 15, they take Mac Jones, a guy who, you know, just me personally, I'm a big Alabama Nick Saban guy. So just the fact that he played at Alabama, I like that. Yep. You know, people can say what they want about Mac Jones. I think he's coming from a great institution. Now, the real question is, and obviously Belichick has said Cam's going to be the guy, you know, this season Cam's our starter and whatnot. And whether Cam ends up losing the job to Mac, jo Mac Jones during the course of the season or not, I'm thinking long term. Yep. Do you feel Mac Jones is the next guy? Is he the guy that the Patriots wanted? Is he the future of the New England Patriots? If you watch our station, you know that we wrestle with this – conversation every night in every different way it's greco-roman wrestling it's oil <laughs> wrestling it's mud wrestling you name a kind of wrestling and we do it how about this what would you guys consider i'm curious because i know that you're you know as, as as expert on this stuff as i am as, in terms of being consumers i might get a chance to talk to people but this is opinion based i have an answer in my mind that you guys might like to hear but I wonder what you guys would define a successful, successful start to Mac Jones' first five years. What's he got to do? I got a definition. I want to hear what you guys would think. Mike, Mike, go first or whoever. First five years, in my opinion, Mac Jones should be the starting quarterback of this team next season. I still personally have – some faith in Cam Newton and also believe that they've put Cam Newton in the prime position to be successful in the 2021 mm -hmm. season. And, you know, for Mac Jones to step in and, and overtake Cam and be the starter, I think he'd have to show a lot within, you know, training camp and whatnot. But I think Bill Belichick, I'm believing when Bill Belichick says he's all in on Cam Newton, he's all in on Cam Newton. But I does think he have to get a second contract. How many playoffs does he have to go to win championships? He, go, go ahead, ahead Mark. Mark. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Mark. As, long, as long as Bill Belichick is his head coach, after his first year of starting, he has to be in the playoffs every year. Got it. I agree. He has to, he has to be I in mean, the playoffs. It can't be because of him that they're missing. Right. Exactly. And I mean, last year there was a lot of there was a lot of reasons why P Patriots didn't make it to the playoffs, right? Quarterback play is is one of them. But it wasn't the it wasn't the only reason why they did, and they were still almost there. I mean, seven and nine is not great, but they, there were games that they could have won if it wasn't for the COVIDs and and such. So Mac mm -hmm. Jones with the team that it looks like we're having for the future, because even though they they went all in this offseason, it looked like they're building something for the long term as well. Mac Jones with the team with Bill Belichick as the head coach has to be in the playoffs every year. My my take is this. For him to be an unqualified success, now I've thrown an unqualified, he has to be better than Jimmy Garoppolo. Mm. Because Jimmy Garoppolo was the heir apparent. Brady yeah, I... forced Belichick to change his timeline. Don't believe all the bullshit about the idea that Robert Kraft overruled Bill. No, Bill understood what he had to do because of what Brady did. But that was the plan was Jimmy. And when Brady blew it up, Belichick has been paralyzed since Halloween 2017 until the <laughs> Mac Jones pick. So now that he's made it, if Mac Jones can be durable, if he can manage an offense, if he can play in all the games, I don't care about a Super Bowl and being a, you know, up 10 in the fourth quarter. That's all. You can't predict that. But if he can answer the bell, play games, take care of the football, put your team in positions to win – be a postseason quarterback and not hold the team hostage at that position, then that's a success. And you want to pick up his fifth year option. That's what's cuckoo, though. What's it going to look like in 2026? Bill's still here. 
like, what's it going to be at the quarterback position? Is it going to be, we'll give Mac Jones $197 million over the next six years? I mean, that's cuckoo, and that's what it'll end up being. being. Yes. I don't know how I said that. It sounded strange. Oh, the being. Um, but that, to me, is fascinating. But I'm with you, Mike. Um, when we talk about the succession, I think that Bill is going to be the last person to finally flip the switch and say, okay, that's enough out of you, Kim. I'm going to, I'm going to, because he can't go and have a short leash and then go away from Cam and then back to him and going back and forth because then yeah, he's going to he start. And my, he can't do the shit that he did last year with this year's team. Not that it was shit. I mean, Cam <laughs> had to come out of some of those games because it was getting bad. Yeah. I mean, but if the he thing with hostage, he's going to come out, but I don't think he's going to hold him hostage. I think he's going to have a good year. Yeah, the thing with Cam, the Cam is he's still young enough, one, and two, the Patriots have built a pretty solid team, something similar to Marv just said. They're building for the future, and they've loaded up this season, and they seem like they can be solid for the next couple of seasons. Cam can, Cam can in all honesty, hold down a starting position with the Patriots for the next – Two, maybe three years. If we see if we see Cam playing at the level of that we've seen from Cam over the years, obviously, you know, father time takes a toll and he's clearly not the same guy he was, you know, several years ago. But the team can can be built and you know the Patriots, they'll find a way to be successful as long as you know the players are there and putting in the work. But Cam could be in a position where possibly he can start this season. You can maybe start next season. Here's and in yeah, three years, he'll be, what, 33, 34? But that, that means that's a contract. I mean, this is – it's fun to play it out. Okay, say Cam goes 12 and 4. All right? They they make it through the divisional round. They lose. It's not his fault. He plays a whole year. And Patriots re-up him. He's going to be looking for $20 million. If you get yeah. that far, the contract, the so contract's going to be huge. Get into that contract. So say Bill says, all right, you know what? I still don't think the friggin' Mac Jones is ready. And then everyone's going to say, you took a, you took a quarterback in the first round <laughs> and you missed on him. He sucks. Bill won't care. It's just, no, the, it's a high leverage. He's got to go. Cam's got to go at some point. Yeah. Right. Marv. No, he has to. He has to. Unless, unless Cam, unless Cam brings you, I'm trying to figure out a way where Cam stays, and it's he brings you a championship, and then you, then you rework a, you work a, a contract with him. Other than that, if he brings you to the playoffs, you're gonna look at Mac Jones and say, everything we just did with Cam, oh, we can do that with this first round pick, Mac Jones, with him. That's how Belichick thinks, anyway. Everything I did with Tom Brady, I'm gonna do with Jimmy Garoppolo. So why can't I do it with Mac Jones? And that's the thing is you, the wild thing about this, and you guys I'm sure know the whole, you know, the math that they love to do in terms of matchups. Every time Cam is on the field, and that's what, we'll, what we will have to document in this offseason, it's 11 on 11 because Cam can run. Yep. When it goes back to Mac Jones, it's 10 on 11. But if Mac Jones is able to deliver the ball better, like, for instance, James White was half of James White last year. Yeah, because Step Cam's back. not accurate because he's not accurate enough to make, make James White useful in the same way Brady was. So you get half of James White back. There's all this math they can do to try and justify it, but they are so different that McDaniel's is going to have to jump through some hoops this year to make it all fit. But I, I, I'm looking at the way they're constructing this team, and it's going to be a friggin' bully. They're drafting 240 pound running backs. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not focused know, on the passing game. Two tight ends, <laughs> no wideouts really. It's interesting. No, no wideouts, and that's I want to stick to the, the wide receiver position. I think that in the offense is the weakest position right now for the Patriots. Nelson Aguilar. I mean, I love all the moves that we made. The Patri that the Patriots had made. Nelson Aguilar still is a head scratcher to me. Just the mm -hmm. the money, the money that they gave him, and now with Edelman gone. The situation that you just put Nelson in now, he's pretty much going to be either your one, your one or your two. Can he fulfill that role as an outside receiver that he was best at compared to the slot receiver where they put him in with the Philadelphia Eagles? That's really a good question. Um, 
and you know how people say, you know, the whole idea of wide receiver one, wide receiver two is, you know, with the Patriots, it's not as accurate. And I, I believe that to be the case, especially with New England, because there's games you see 14 targets to Shane Vereen or James White or, yeah. you know, whoever. I'm sorry, my hand slipped. Um, you might see games where it's going to be nine targets to Hunter Henry and six to Johnny Smith and three to Nelson Aguilar. But your point is well taken. The wide receiver group has to be complementary. Aguilar fills that because he is probably your fastest guy outside of the new guy that they just took in the seventh round here, who I think is actually kind of interesting. Um, whose name is escaping? Trey, 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 Trey Nixon. Nixon. Trey Nixon. Trey Nixon. Yeah. Who the frig is Trey Davis? <laughs> <laughs> All these friggin' names flying around. But, um, yeah, Aguilar, between Aguilar, Johnny Smith, Hunter Henry, James White, and whether it's Bourne and if, if and Jacoby Myers, yeah. it's five guys you should be able to put out in the route. They have complementary skills, in my estimation. I, I definitely want to keep it with the wide receivers because here's a name that we've thrown out in season. Mm. Marv smiling. He already knows where I'm going. Goes. I don't even want to hear it. Season after I season. I got it. I got to ask it again because what the, this, what is this going to be? Season number four? Year four for this guy? Year three. Year three? Oh, it's big deal. I thought you were going to say, how about Julio Jones? Because that's Phil's thing. So <laughs> the friggin table for Julio Jones. Hey, if you can make that happen. People are probably asking, hey, see if you can get Aaron Rodgers. He wants out of Green Bay too. But I definitely, definitely got to ask about Nikhil Harry because yep. – we're talking about a guy now. This is three years in the system, injury or no injury. The fact that remains that he's been within the system, has learned the playbook, all of all of that piled together. He's been here. You, you mentioned Aguilar. You mentioned Bourne. Obviously, Jacoby Myers has shown a lot. Yep. Is there any way that we see some kind of light of shining hope from this guy that the Patriots took with their first pick uh, three years ago? Is there any possible yeah. chance yeah, there that we is get something chance. from him. But, you know, you've worked with guys I don't know, maybe Marv is like this. Sometimes he shows up and he's fantastic and he does all the things that he's supposed to do and you're like, you know what? This is why I work with Marv. I knew this was Marv. This is my Marv. This is what we're looking for. And then Marv's not there. And you say, Marv, my neck is killing me. I can't make it in today, Mike. Uh, it happens. Right. Well, it was your knee last week, remember? <laughs> and before that, you ran the wrong route and got clubbed by somebody. I mean, that's the thing. is it? It's consistently something. Like, he needed a camp this year, even with COVID and everything else. He needed a camp where he just strung days together. Yeah. They fed him. They pounded the ball to him. Stidham pounded it to him. Um, Cam pounded it to him. And he'd have these dominant practices, and then the next practice he was gone. And then he came back, and he'd have three drops in the next one. And it just, to me, it seems as if, and these guys are 22, and my middle son is the same age as Nikhil. And I can't imagine my middle son being third year in the NFL right now. It's just, it's a lot. And I just don't think he's ready for the intensity of it. Maybe he will be, but I think he needs a, he needs a fresh start someplace. Agree or disagree on watching him because you guys are watching it too. Does he not look like a guy who's like just lost in the system? Yeah, lost I in the see, sauce. Lost I, in I the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think the San um the C Seattle game we all remember that Seattle game where he he just Cam is directing him where to go, just run run across and it just he's lost. And then you look at Myers and it's fifty nine catches for eight hundred yards. Yeah, he didn't get. You know, he's not great after the catch. He's not that fast, but he catches everything and he competes and he's open in short spaces. And it's like nobody drafted him. <laughs> and this guy was a first round pick. And it's like it just looks bad, too. Yeah. Huge. It's it's tough. I this this might be it. This might be it for Nikhil Harry, in all honesty. This is this is his last chance, in my opinion. Obviously, he's probably he's pro he had a chance last year. He's much higher on the depth chart last year. He's definitely taking a couple steps back. But I mean, the bus he, is leaving. <laughs> exactly, it is. It, and we see with New England Patriot receivers, once it doesn't work out here, it's it's tough for them to catch any footing. What happened to Aaron Dobson? He went to the Steelers for a minute. 
Um, and then I think the party was over. I mean, just it's it's wild. I mean, you have one of the most ingenious offensive coordinators. You have the greatest head coach. You've had the greatest quarterback. And I mean, you got tight ends, one of whom, you know, could have been on the track for a Hall of Fame if he wasn't a sociopath. And the other one who is going to go to the Hall of Fame. You have wide receivers that you find like Welker or Edelman or Amendola who end up being huge parts of it. You pluck LaFell, who wasn't very good in Carolina, comes here, has a couple good years. Lloyd was decent. Cooks was decent. Better than decent, if you ask me. But in the draft, you just like them. Once they get here, they're, they just their brain falls out their ears. They're no good. <laughs> It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. I, it's definitely early, and you know this question will definitely come up in various conversations left and right. But obviously, we've we've seen all the moves Patriots made offensively, defensively. When we look early outlook of the season, the twenty twenty one season, what will what do you think will say that the Patriots' strength is? Because obviously, you know they're getting a leader back on defense and Dante Hightower. Uh, they've added some other huge names in our offense. We've, we've talked about, you know, Smith and Hunter Henry and these guys that they've added. Will their, will their strength be in their offense or their defense? This team is going to be an absolute defensive pain in the ass every week. Yeah, They are going to be a problem. And the reason for that, in my estimation, is you have to keep Judon healthy and you have to keep Hightower healthy. But between Judon, Hightower, Van Noy, and if Winovich sticks around, I think I, I kind of see him as as a guy who would be a great trade chip because he would be valuable elsewhere. And I sometimes feel he's not a great fit. But if Winovich sticks around, Dietrich Wise is a factor in the rush in the in the pass rush. So you have a pass rush that literally didn't exist yet last year. They went from forty seven sacks to twenty four. Meanwhile, up front, you have Henry Anderson's been added. Lawrence Guy is back, which I don't think the Patriots thought was going to happen, but because nobody had any money to do it, he's back. Um, again, Wise is back. It's just a way better front seven, along with Kyle Duggar going into his next year, second year, Uche going into his second year, and Fernie Jennings going into his second year. I think defensively, they're going to be a problem for teams. And as a result, you're going to ball control offense with a battering running game and two tight ends and a quarterback who can run the football too. We might see a lot of 23, 20 throwback bully boy football. That's, that's what I think. And as a result, when you had a shitty offense, excuse me, shitty roster last year because of COVID, because of opt outs, um, because of mismanagement, that team still won seven games. So you bring these guys back, you bump it up, you take COVID out of the mix it's got to be four or five wins there. Definitely. So it's 12 and five. I got to get used to the 17 games. Yeah. 12, 12 and that's, that would be a successful, successful year. But I want to hear Tom, what are you hearing about this whole Gilmore situation? It's been real quiet in the off season. Yep. You know that we know that the Patriots were in talks of maybe trading them during the year off. Season. What's going on with this Gilmore situation right now? Stefan Gilmore from my understanding, does not want to go anywhere else. He wants to play for the Patriots. Okay. The $7.5 million contract, excuse me, salary for which he will play this year is insufficient relative to what other corners are paid. Now, you can say, well, he agreed to that. Well, the corner market kind of did explode. Xavier Howard, Darius Slay, guys are making upwards of $20 million. Now, Steph can't expect that at 32, with the cap dropping, he's going to get any place close to that. But I think with $16 million in cap space still, and the guy having been Defensive Player of the Year two years ago, and again playing at a Pro Bowl level, even though there were some games where I just didn't think he played like himself last year, you've got a playoff caliber challenger in the AFC now that you didn't have last year. Keep the best guy in your secondary around. So he wants to stay. He believes he's underpaid. I don't know if a holdout would be coming, but I personally, this is not what I know. What I know is that he wants a raise, but he also wants to stay. 
I think the Patriots are too good a team to be trading away a cornerback like Stephon Gilmore at this juncture. Right. Right. Especially like you mentioned, Josh Allen got some boys with him <laughs> that can, and he can throw that, he can throw that thing. 100%. So keep Gilmore. And they got, look at all the quarterbacks. I did a schedule story today. You got Lawrence, you got Mayfield, you got Darnold, you got uh, Wentz, you got, it's just first round pick. There's only two games against quarterbacks who were not top 10 picks. You got Deshaun Watson. It's Brady and Dak are the only mm. non first round quarterbacks that they'll see. Otherwise, it's just quarterback after quarterback after quarterback. It's going to be a fun, fun year. So the schedule has not dropped yet. Mm. Wednesday. Wednesday, the schedule drops. Right. All right. Our show's coming out. Um, you know, we'll be live. Tuesday, um, but just thinking about the schedule. I mean, you already gave your prediction of uh, what you what did you say? Twelve and twelve and five, five, eleven and six. You got to be looking at a four to five game improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Give yourself some wiggle room. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, obviously the one game everybody is circled on that game for sure is Tom Brady's return to New England. Um, you know, just thinking about it now, it seems crazy. But how how dramatic or how outlandish do you think a return ceremony, everything that they can throw together for this guy making his return? Do you think that they're going to go all out for this guy coming back to New England? You know, that'll be fascinating. Um, I think that Bill won't like the idea of it. You know, we're trying to play a game here. I mean, it's... <laughs> plenty of time to do all these things at another time. I mean, but you know, Robert Kraft is very sensitive to the perception that he in any way ushered Brady out the door. He made it very clear that this was Bill's decision and that Robert would honor it. He made his hopes clear that he wanted Brady to stay. So now that Brady will come back as a member of the Buccaneers, I think that Robert will want a very specific, maybe not long, but specific salute to the player who was here. And as awkward as it might be, I think that, that, that they would be interested in doing that probably in the, the run up to the game somehow. You got to do mm. it. You can't you gotta do, do something. It. You got to do something. Um, and I think the Belichick would probably be smart too to get, you know, put his hands together. And I'm sure, sure that he would. He's, he's no dummy when he, when it comes time to understanding he's very calculated but he also knows when to hit the right notes. And I think that if you did a pregame 45 minute, thanks Tom thing, seven minutes before kickoff, I think the bill would clap a little bit. <laughs> He'd be smart enough to do that. Yeah. So didn't make a, but I think that that would be the extent of it. But when you think about it, guys, it, it is unprecedented in some ways. I mean, yeah. who could we come up with in any sport? Gretzky going back to Edmonton. I mean, <sighs> No. Jordan Jordan going back to Chicago as a member of the Wizards after know, after he won a championship. championship with the Wizards. Yeah, he has to win a championship with the Wizards. It's true. Oh, right. It, it's is there anybody? Not that Kobe I can think of. LeBron. I mean, LeBron. It's all manufactured anyway. I guess LeBron would be the only thing Le close. LeBron. Yeah, Le but LeBron. LeBron left, and fans hated him for it. Brady left, and we were crying that he left. Like they fans well, wanted funny, him to. But people have turned now, don't you think? Like people. Have yeah, turned. after the super, after they the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think man. I think we can end it off on this last point here. So we brought up Tom Brady winning the championship. Belichick obviously seen that. I'm not one to believe that he made all of these moves just because Brady won a championship. Obviously, we knew we knew about the cap. He's been talking about – he pretty much gave us hints that he was going to make these moves. But how motivated are the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick to get one more, one more without Tom Brady? I just – you know, so many people have said that for so long, even when Brady was here, said, you know, Bill wants to prove he can do it without Tom. I never believed that to be the case, but now that we've seen what's unfolded since Brady has left, it has to be somewhere down on the list around That's number 18 <laughs> as motivations for reasons why. Because fucking Brady won one. That's why. 
<laughs> that, that, right away, too. Right away. It's not like oh. Brady won. <laughs> I'm sorry if you have to beep that out. No, <laughs> no, we, we're, good. Good. we're good here on Double S. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what he would say. Uh, Brady. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it can't be the – he wants to compete. If Brady had retired and decided to go be a surf instructor, he'd still want to win just as much. Right. But to shut people up is always a motivation for Bill, too, I think. I hear that. I, th I think the fire was always lit under Bill, but I know seeing the confetti fall on Brady and him hoisting that trophy, I know that had to kick him in the ass just a little bit, just a little bit extra that night. When yeah. the and some of the Bruce Arian stuff probably drives him bananas too. Yeah, that, that's what it is. Nah, you know, Bruce... we, we treat him a little different up here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Arian's such a goof. He's such a, he's such a I goof. Can't, I can't I can't throw darts at anybody who's a goof. I'm a goof too, but he is a goof. Uh, <laughs> oh man. Tom, this this is this this conversation, you know, it's early in the off, off season again, training camp, OTA is coming up soon. So the conversations with football with Patriots will continue. You know, I hope hopefully this isn't the last time we can have you here on Double M talking some good sports and football and even diving into some more conversations another time for sure. But with this time here, we're very appreciative of you joining Double M, being a guest here and just sharing your insights, your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions, and just being real with us here, being real with us on Double that's, M. That's all we ask here is the realness, and that's what you brought for us, Tom. Well, I appreciate it. Next time I won't do the floating head studio <laughs> special effects <laughs> special effects we, we're all for it <laughs> all right guys thanks so much double m live we appreciate you thanks for having appreciate me. appreciate you tom thanks a lot man take it easy take care and this double m live mike nice tommy curran marvazan we'll see you guys next week